Hello, I'm volcanologist Dr. Janine Krupner, and this is my guest. Hi, I'm John Major. I'm a research hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey Cascades Volcano Observatory. Thank you so much for joining me for this Mount St. Helens 40th anniversary special. You've done a lot of incredible work looking at lahars, especially from the Mount St. Helens eruption 40 years ago. So can you give us a very brief overview of what happened on May 18th, what a lahar actually is? Sure. So the, the May 18th eruption, um, many people may or you know, may not know, was not a, just a single event, but it was this whole cascade of events that happened. Um, the eruption started with a gigantic landslide that peeled off the north face of the volcano. Um, that then triggered what has been called the so-called lateral blast, this, this laterally directed explosion that swept out across the landscape, and that's what knocked all the trees down that people have probably seen lots of the famous photographs of that. But in addition to those events, there were also these so-called lahars. And a lahar is a, think of, think of a, a slurry or a milkshake or, or think of a, a soupy uh, batch of cement that you might mix up to do work in your yard. And these are these, a lahar is just this, this slurry of sediment and water that can flow down a river valley for long distances. And on the morning of May 18th, 1980, um, there were multiple lahars that were triggered by the eruption, and they were formed in two different ways, actually. Um, the first lahars that passed through some of the river systems were actually triggered by this directed blast, because that, that blast not only went horizontally, but some of it went vertically and spilled up and over the, the rims of the volcano um, on the west side and the east side. And as it spilled over the volcano, it melted some of the snow and ice that was on the volcano, and it it triggered a sort of a flash flood, and as this flash flood went through the river system, it eroded a bunch of sediment and ultimately became sort of this thick, soupy slurry of sediment and water that, that flowed, you know, nearly 60 miles down the, the river valleys all the way out to the Columbia River. So that was one way that a lahar formed. And then another way, and what triggered actually the largest lahar of, of the May 18th eruption, is that when that big landslide uh, slid off the mountain, it took with it glacier ice and it took with it some of the groundwater system that was within the volcano. And throughout the morning of May 18th, some of that groundwater and, and melted ice that was with, trapped within the debris avalanche or the big landslide deposit began seeping out of that deposit. And over a matter of hours, more and more of it seeped out and began to coalesce. And then it would start to flow down the 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 system a little bit and it would erode sediment as it was flowing down and and over a span of many hours um, this very large lahar due to seepage of water out of the big landslide deposit uh, was generated and went downstream so that's a that's a rather unusual way for a lahar to form but but that was the formation of the most destructive lahar um, on may 18th it's incredible when we look back 40 years ago how the landscape changed so drastically within minutes to hours so 40 years later, with all of that sediment, that volcanic rock that was redistributed in the environment, looking downstream, what is the impact of that today? Sure. So, you know, the eruption with all these events, this, this giant landslide, the lahars and everything else, it, it just dumped an enormous amount of sediment into the, the river valley surrounding the volcano. And as mother nature likes to do, it tended to, you know, erode and redistribute that sediment and begin to flush it downstream. And um, there are two, two principal issues related to sedimentation and sediment in the river valleys. The first was that because of these big lahars that went down the river systems, uh, once they got down into the lower rivers down where the communities are located, you know, 75 miles downstream from the volcano, a lot of that sediment was deposited on the bed of the, the river channel. And it, it made the, it brought the river bed up. And so you, it triggered a lot of flooding and it blocked the, the commercial traffic on the Columbia River. Um, so the, the Army Corps of Engineers had to go in and, and dredge out the sediment in order to open back up the shipping lanes, but also to uh, minimize the flood hazard that resulted from too much sediment being accumulated on the channel bed. So over the past several decades now, uh, lots of sediment has been eroded and washed down the river systems. And as that sediment, again, gets down into the lower river valleys, uh, 
it again settles out on the riverbed and it causes issues with regard to flood hazards in the communities downstream. And looking at a more drastic change, um, <laughs> I know there's several levels of drastic change that happened on May 18th. Spirit Lake was moved and it was raised by this enormous dam of debris avalanche deposit. And back um, not long after there, they realized there was a flood hazard and they made a tunnel to let some of that water out. But 40 years later, what is the risk at Spirit Lake and what is having to be done today? Sure, so when this big landslide deposit um, slid off the north face of the volcano, um, it came down into what's called the North Fork of the Tootle River Valley, right at the foot of the volcano. And at the foot of the volcano was also this lake called, very famous lake called Spirit Lake. And that landslide deposit not only blocked the outlet of the lake, but it also raised up the bed and the surface of the lake. In fact, um, the bed of the lake today is higher than the surface of the lake prior to the 1980 eruption. Um, both, both bed and surface were raised almost 200 feet. So in addition to that transformation of the, the, the lake basin itself, this big landslide deposit blocked the outlet to Spirit Lake. So now you've got essentially a lake in a drainless bathtub when water has no place to go. But rainfall and snow melt didn't turn off and so water kept accumulating in the lake and when you have no place to go, the, the lake level would continue to rise. And the concern was that ultimately, if, if nothing was done, the lake would raise to the point where it would overtop the blockage and trigger a massive flood and another really big lahar that would rush down the system and cause even more damage to the downstream communities. And what, what, uh, what we learned um, in, the af in the aftermath of the 1980 eruption was that um, within the geologic record of the Tootle River Valley, there's a lahar deposit that record is the record of a lahar that was roughly 10 times bigger than the one that happened on May 18th, 1980. And the characteristics of that deposit are such that it, it tells us that the origin of that lahar was the result of uh, a breaching of Spirit Lake about 3,000 years ago. So about 3,000 years ago, Mount St. Helens also had another um, debris avalanche, big land, a landslide that came down, blocked the outlet of Spirit Lake. Only at that point, Spirit Lake was able to rise up over top the blockage and, and trigger this flood and lahar that went downstream. So we knew what possibly could happen or what would happen if Spirit Lake was allowed to, to breach its current blockage from the 1980 eruption. So to prevent that from happening and to uh, provide an outlet for the lake water to drain, the Army Corps of Engineers drilled a tunnel, bored a tunnel through bedrock um, to provide an outlet. And that tunnel's worked pretty effectively for the past three plus decades. Um, but as it passes through the bedrock, that tunnel encounters some weak rock zones, some shear zones within the, the bedrock. And over time, those uh, weakened zones tend to deform a bit and they tend to try to squeeze the tunnel shut. So the Army Corps of Engineers has had to go back in on several occasions and do repairs to the tunnel. And when they do repairs to that tunnel, they have to close the tunnel off and so water can't get out of the lake. And on a few occasions, um, these repairs have had to be done in the winter time and these are repairs that require the tunnel to be shut down for a long period of time, you know, three, four, five months. And during that time, the lake level has then risen up to a point that started to get a little bit problematic. And if it had ris continued to rise, um, it could potentially have gotten to a level that ultimately might have led to a, a breaching of the blockage. Um, now, not to say that if the tunnel couldn't, if, if the tunnel was to fail today, the lake would not breach tomorrow. There's a, there'd be a long buffer time and probably plenty of time to, to mitigate it. Um, but that's, that's the issue today is that um, the tunnel does require some maintenance and this maintenance requires closing it, which then allows the tunnel to rise. So, so there's some work undergoing uh, being done today to try to evaluate other potential options for getting water out of the lake. And um, so, but here we are, you know, 40 years after the, the eruption that, that 
block the lake and we're still have to, having to deal with how to get water out of the lake in a safe and effective manner. It's a really important point um, and good time to remember that while an eruption might last hours or days or months, in the case of Mount St. Helens, the impacts of that can last for decades. So oh, thank for you sure. so much for joining me for this video. I appreciate you being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks.